pretty sold off show, my favorite. Um, I'm Tammy Morton, I'm the manager of the programs here at the Broad. I'm very, very happy and delighted to introduce this evening two experimental compositions that are being produced in conjunction with the Broad MSU exhibition postscript, Writing After Conceptual Art, which is um, on the second floor of the museum as well as uh, in the lower level. Um, if you haven't checked out Postscript yet, I encourage you all to do so. Um, Postscript um, engages with text-based artwork and the artistic possibilities of language. First up tonight, we have a composition by Mark Sullivan. Mark is the Associate Professor of Composition here at MSU. I'm sure a lot of you know who Mark is. He's going to be um, introducing us to an electroacoustic piece called um, sound polygon tests. Um, Mark's work creates sound analogs based on the architecture of our building tonight. Um, Professor Sullivan will essentially be translating the museum's architecture into sound. And he's going to be using um, uh, a software that was actually developed um, by Giannis Zanakis. Some of you may remember uh, back in December we um, produced an amazing concert um, with Zach Fredell. Um, uh, called Zanak, Access for Zanakis. And that, um, that composer basically created um, the software that Mark is using tonight for our program. Um, after Professor Sullivan's piece, we'll have our featured work, Polygon. It's a new collaborative concert created by MSU College of Music graduate students Philip Rice and Patrick Bonzik. Hello. Polygon investigates the, the relationship between language, music, and visual expression by appropriating texts from ancient and modern mathematicians, theologians, and even an origami master. Um, these texts are deconstructed into morphemes, which are the smallest units of measurement in language, um, which then undergo chance operations to form a sonic design for singers and, and instrumentalists tonight. I'm very, very excited to see what you guys do. I don't even really know what they're going to be doing, which is part of the fun of uh, my job. Uh, and without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Mark, who's going to talk a little bit about his piece. And at the end of each piece, I think that we're going to have a little Q&A. Is that right? So um, I'll hand it over to Mark. Thank you. OK. I'd like to thank Tammy and the Broad Museum for hosting this concert. I'd also like to thank Philip for inviting me to be part of it. And I really will say only a few brief things. The program that you mentioned is very interesting and it does allow you to make sketches and draw and then you have lots of choices and decisions like about how you're going to turn those things into sound. And uh, if you want to know about that, I can tell you afterwards. But for the moment, uh, I think it would, should suffice to know that I worked with some sketches of the outside of the building from various perspectives, the inside, including this room, and the top of the stairs and the bottom of the stairs. There's another aspect of what's going on here that's incorporated in the piece, which has to do with the, the exhibit, which is here, which I would encourage you all to take the time to look at if you can't do it tonight. Come back. It's called a postscript. So one aspect of the piece has to do with that concept. Postscript, as you know, is kind of an afterthought or something that you append to the end after you thought you were done and you thought of something else. So um, my piece actually uses two quoted segments from earlier pieces that I created. And the sounds of the building sort of wrap around those and make them in, in a way, because they're transformed, they're not just quoted, but they're also reworked and uh, transformed by various routines that are part of that program. So in a way, it is an actual kind of musical postscript. And that's basically it. We will have some time for questions afterwards. The piece is about 10 minutes long.
I'm sure some of you have some questions about that piece. I know I do. Um, anyone? Right here. Well, I was which elements of that piece, which sections were borrowed from your earlier works? You said there were two sections, right? Well, there's two sources. Okay. Uh, <coughs> loud, aggressive, harsh sound. The loud, aggressive, harsh sound comes from an earlier piece called Bits, which was based on a, it's a, actually a piece where I decided not to set a text to music because I thought the text didn't need it. It was powerful and beautiful without my music. But I wanted to write a piece, so I tried to write a piece that would get somebody to go and find that text. So I took parts of her text and incorporated it into my piece so that you couldn't possibly tell what her text was about. But I helped it to motivate somebody to want to find it. It's called Images Between You and Me, and her name is Hedvig, Hedvig Stosa. And uh, the other piece is a piece called Masks, which is a piece that I did with three other people for the MSU Museum based on their mask collection. That's almost all sample sound. Does anyone else have a question? Right here? Uh, could you describe a little bit of the program? Could you describe a little bit of the program in the Tanakas? They want to pay that you uh, work with. Is it what program is it close to, or is it, how, what does it even look like on your computer? 
Did everybody hear that? He asked to know a little bit more about the program, what it looks like on the computer screen and how it works. Basically, it is the program that Zanakis developed. Zanakis developed it, what's called a UBIC, which is uh, an acronym in French, and my French is non-existent, so I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it has, um, basically, that software after Zanakis died was transported to other platforms like Mac and PC. It was developed actually at the Center for Mathematics and Acoustic Music, where Zanakis worked in Paris, which was a center not really for the earcom, and it actually was a joint department for mathematics and music. And uh, so the program allows you to choose sounds that get mapped into whatever you draw, and it has like most computer drawing programs, it has constraints that you can put. So you can draw freehand, or you can constrain it to draw straight lines, draw angles, draw broad bands, thin bands. And essentially, you can compile a kind of graphic score, and then you can choose which aspects of those graphic symbols get uh, mapped onto what kind of sounds, and it includes a library of sample sound. You can bring in your own samples, but you can also generate sound with it. And, and, and Mark, so you, you use the Broad Museum as your sort of um, uh, blueprint, blueprint to feed into that system, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, I took the photographs from the Broad Museum from the website, and I chose three from the exterior building, two, one in this room, two from the stairway, one from upstairs, and brought those in and used them as a template for the drawing. So it's like, when I was a kid, I used to draw uh, hot rods and buy hot rod magazines and trace them, take tracing paper and draw them, and my friends and I thought that was cool. So maybe uh, this is a chance for me to finally use it skill. You can do hot rods next time. They might sound even cooler, but I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> Any other questions for Mark? Okay, we're going to take just a second to get ready for Polygon, the language of shapes. The songs were understood 
uh, by the audience as humanity's attempt to make contact with that region of the shapes. Uh, and perhaps this was a, uh, a tired platonic aspiration to perfect our rhythm forms. Um, but I, I remember feeling in the dream a mystical energy emanating from those shapes. And I knew that uh, we could actually interact with them. And I imagined that they were uh, something like the smooth, idealized bodies of angels. I love the opera reflecting on the roughness of the human experience. The attempts to communicate at superhuman levels, though, were not um, only empowering, but also curative. And I no longer felt sick from the meal I had. When I woke up, I told this dream to my roommate and composer, Philip. And Polygon, the work that um, my friends and I are about to present to you, is not a recreation of that dream or reconstruction. It's an extension of that dream, and a second try, if you will, at uh, uh, accomplishing the goals in that dream. So the first movement that we're going to do um, it's sort of the first try, there's four movements, they're sort of like essays, um, attempts to explore this topic in different ways. Um, and Patrick, do you want to tell them a little bit about how you created the text for the first movement? It's very interesting. Yeah, so um, I, let me just give you the, the, the design of the entire, entire uh, work um, with its text. The first movement comes from the fourth century, and it's about hidden meaning in words. The second movement, um, is by a mathematician uh, and theologian, Boethius, about the silent music of the spheres, the celestial spheres, that have been a primary source of inspiration for our human music for generations. The second statement in that movement, the second movement, is Boethius' assertion that the study of uh, musical form is dependent on mathematics. Movement three is a constructed dialogue between an origami master, um, Akira Yoshizawa, who died in 2005, and a living geometer, um, Orla Lomel. While Lomel is excited about his research, uh, about finding this really great um, uh, design for making nautilus shells, Yoshizawa's words uh, which I took from interviews that he had near the end of his life, remind us that while math can advance and enliven origami art, the highest aim must always be to assist the expression of human desires. Uh, movement four returns us back to the symphony of bodies, both celestial and terrestrial. Here, human song informs celestial music and is curative as in the um, and just a bit about the first movement, because that, um, that I think, has, has undergone the most construction. Uh, in the fourth century, St. Basil uh, recognized the benefits of song, whether or not its spiritual implications were known to the performer. I broke up the following English translation, or the translation that you see on the program, um, of St. Basil's words into the morphemes, and I reorganized them into ways that I felt were studying. The result is a fragmented but vaguely intelligible uh, statement. However, I think that the meaning of the uh, original is preserved. That is, whether we understand it or not, when we sing, we work towards something. Great. So when Patrick gave me that libretto for the first movement, I wanted to create music that would go along with the way he deconstructed the, the text and put it back together. So I sort of. Um, I guess mapped the text onto music, sort of the way Dr. Sullivan was talking about mapping a picture into a musical sound. Uh, so you'll hear at the beginning the original text in its original form, and it's through composed with um, each sort of sentence or each main idea with its own musical key area or, or its own chord. Uh, and then when it gets put back together again, you'll hear each part from whence it came with its sound that it originally had. So you'll hear the music alternating very quickly between very different sounds uh, because the you know, parts 
sort of like a puzzle that falls apart and you put it back together in a way that doesn't fit. So you might see like a house next to a tree that wasn't there before. You'll hear a chord next to a chord that wasn't there originally. So hopefully that will come through. And you may have seen on the bottom of the program, you are welcome to applaud the three movements. I'd like to keep this a little bit more informal. And I'll tell you a little bit about the second movement before we do that. So here's the first movement of Polygon.
<laughs> okay, so this second movement uh, Patrick talked to you a little bit about um, is about this idea that the heavens um, actually create a sound through their mechanism, or through their through their motion, which we now know, of course, is not true. The heavens are actually silent. There's no sound in space. But in the sixth century, that seems to make sense to everyone. Um, so this is an attempt to sort of realize, perhaps, what the heavens sound like. Um, and I constructed this piece um, as a sort of mechanism itself. So you may have seen in museums or in or in books on the history of astronomy, you may have seen something called a planisphere, which is like a, a metal device, it's made of metal or wood that maps the motions of the heavens in a 3D model. So you can actually see like there'll be a little planet and you crank a turn a crank and it will move the planets through this mechanism. Um, these devices were really novelties. They didn't they didn't actually help too much in, in telling where the planets would be. They were horribly inaccurate. And like those mechanisms, this piece doesn't really inform us about much. Um, but it does operate within a mechanical structure. So you'll hear patterns that repeat over and over again and don't quite line up with each other. Um, so this is mechanism of the sky. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay, so this third movement is probably the most experimental of them all. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to have uh, Clark and Jefferson here doing the narration. Um, Jefferson actually is a sculpture, you're both sculpture students, yeah? More or less. More or less sculpture <laughs> students, which is great, because this is more or less music what you're about to hear. Um, so so the, the text of this uh, movement is, as Patrick mentioned, uh, an interpolation of um, an origami master talking in very emotional um, and subjective uh, senses about uh, origami, about how it makes us feel and, and how it is evocative of life. Um, and then there's also another text which you don't see particularly in your program, which will be read by our narrators, which is a very scientistic, mathematical, um, analytical approach to origami. Uh, and to express that idea, I took the text the weird mathematical text, and I mapped it onto square pieces of, of paper uh, in a grid. And then I folded those pieces of paper into origami things. And then I looked to see which words were touching each other in the folds. So there are some very strange, sort of creepy things that happened, um, like words that would repeat themselves that were of particular importance. Or the one that really scared me was the word plan a spiral which is a reference to the novelist show being a spiral on a single plane. Um, that word ended up being at the center of the page, so it mapped out to itself all different ways and kept repeating. So it was sort of spiraling in on itself, it was very scary. Um, but anyway, so you'll hear, you'll hear the original text read by Clark, and then the folded text read by Jefferson. And then you'll hear some, uh, you'll hear some music from us that's an attempt to fold literally the instruments that we're playing. So Alex and I are making shapes with our hands or with our mallets on the keyboard, uh, circular, triangular, square shapes. And then um, our instrumentalists, our flute and saxophone, will be um, sort of improvising folded patterns. So they'll be going up with one scale and down with another, sort of like music folding in on itself. And I'll let so the singers show you what they're going to do when we get there. Thank you. 
last movement, I know I said that one was the most experimental, but this one might be actually the most experimental, at least for the players. It won't sound as strange to you, maybe, but... Um, so this text comes from the 15th century, um, and some of you may know this, some of you may not, but in the 15th century it became sort of popular and continued on through the Renaissance for astronomers and mathematicians to create these elaborate diagrams of the heavens that again, like the planisphere, don't really show useful scientific information, but help express ideas about like where God lives, like in the outer sphere, or, or where we are at the center. Um, these sort of ideas that we now know are not true, but can be dis displayed in a very beautiful form. Um, and so I laid out the music in one of these diagrams. Uh, the music that they're looking at is in a, the shape of a pentagon. Um, but I created a cheat sheet for them so they don't have to turn their heads to see how the music goes. <laughs> Um, and if you look back at the first text, there's this bit about um, singing realness and the idea of, of the interaction of the real and the ideal. And if the, if the first three movements are an attempt at the ideal, this last movement is an attempt at the real. So all of the notes that you'll hear are naturally occurring notes, um, which to musicians you know what I'm talking about, but to those of you who don't know, when you strike a, a pitch on, a, say, a vibraphone or pluck a string on a violin, there are other higher frequencies called overtones that aren't quite as perceptible, but that can be brought out in various ways by touching the string in other ways. Um, so we're only going to be singing notes that would naturally occur in the overtone series. Um, and so it creates sort of a sound like a wind chime or an alien harp, a sort of pure natural music with no other um, interjections. And everything that they're doing is going to be improvised. So there's also this element of the real being the real within us, our own impulses or our own natural desires for the music to take shape. So this is the last moment of Polygon.
Philip, that was quite stunning. Thank you so very much. Wonderful. Um, I just want to take a second to see if any of you have any questions at all for um, Philip and Patrick. Um, this is your chance to ask them. If not, yes. I knew there would be somebody. This is, uh, I guess this is a question for Patrick, but how does tonight's attempt, so to speak, uh, compare to the one in your dream? Uh, well, it is never every time. And the idea is um, collective energy. Uh, and I think what Philip did with the last, how he won the last one was really, really fantastic. So um, uh, it's, it's kind of swirl of um, activity. Uh, and I think this is also even, um, more successful because I, because uh, we had a reason to come back together to do it, right? So, hope that answers your question. Anyone else? If not, I would like to thank you all very much for coming to me. Sarah Tomlinson on flute, um, Alex Smith on vibes, Casey Thread on alto saxophone, and Clark Bowman and Jefferson Kilwaggy as the narrators. So a special thanks to them as well.